welcome to Barrier Temple International Church's podcast. I am your host, Timothy, and we're here together on this beautiful day to hear from God. Today, we're fortunate to have our beloved pastor, Mike Gonzalez, with us, who will be sharing God's word. So let's all prepare ourselves to receive what God has in store for us today. Let's begin. So we are in our series, our new series, We Are. So last year we did I Am. This year we are, we are. Now, if you weren't here last week, let me give you just a little bit of introduction. We looked at who God was and who we were in Him, And now we are going to spend this year looking at who we, Berea Temple International Church, take out just a little bit of the heat out of this, if you would. I'm getting just a bit of an echo and a little feedback. We are as Berea Temple. We are going to look at who we are as the church. In our first stop in our series, we're going to build out a phrase, if you will, as to who we are. And the first thing that we are is we are an Assemblies of God church. And for some of us, we are new to our fellowship. We are new to Pentecostal theology. We are new to the Assemblies of God. Some of us have been here all our lives, and we already know a lot of this. But I think it would behoove us for this year. And so we are going to establish who we are so that we're all on the same page. Might I get a couple of hands? Where did they disappear to? All right, well, we'll keep going. We're going to spend the next little bit of time going through what we call the 16 fundamental truths. Last week, Sister Letitia opened us up with her passage, the scriptures, and today we are going to look at number two, the one true God. So if I were to ask you a question, this is going to be an opportunity, normally A sermon is a monologue. I speak, you listen, that's just kind of, or whoever is up here speaks, and we as a congregation listen. But today, I want us to talk back. I want you to give me some feedback. And so, since I didn't get it up here, we're going to go over here. We're going to come down on the floor. So I brought, or I had brought, our handy dandy whiteboard up. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I think we'll just leave it right there. So these topics are a little bit more uh, educational, informational, when we talk about doctrine. And so there will be more heavily on the preaching side, but there's going to be a little bit here and there on the teaching side. So if I were to ask you, give me just some descriptive words about God. What would you say? This is your opportunity to speak back. Give me just something that describes God. Powerful. Okay, just, you can just shout it out. Sister Grace, I saw that hand. Creator. Okay, thank you. Holy. Okay. Faithful? Merciful? Okay. All right. Sorry? Eternal. Eternal. All right. All right, so we'll stop there with lots of descriptive words. Now, I'm going to say, tell you, you went a different direction than what I thought we would go with this, and that's okay. It doesn't mess up the sermon. It just enhances what we're already going to talk about. So, now what I want to do is I want to read a passage for you. Let 
No, you know what? We'll do it the other way. We're going to do it this opposite since I'm already down here. Okay? Now, what would you, write, what would you say if I wrote... What descriptive words would you use there? Okay? I'm sorry? Savior, okay? Lamb of God? Redeemer? Light of the world. These are all very good. Okay. So, sorry? Lord. All right, good. We'll stop there. Come on, Mike, get your fingers working. Okay. I would blame it on cold hands, but it's just, I'm just a really bad handwriter, uh, if you can't tell. Uh, so I'd love to be able to blame it on something else, but it is what it is. So, this still works. Because if you'll take a look at the two sides, we use different term, different terminology for the two people, correct? So we described God, the Father, one way. We described Jesus, the Son, with a different set of terminology. Now, one could argue that these are interchangeable, but nonetheless, we used different words. So now if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 14 and verse 9. John chapter 14 and verse 9. It says this, it says, Jesus replied, I have been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, so why are you asking me to show him to you? So let that sit for a second. Contemplate, think through that statement. Now, again, for most of us, this is going to be a, a simplistic moment. But for some of us, this might be a light bulb moment. Because again, we used as a, as a body, and, and again, I prompted none of you other than just give me a word that describes. None of you were plants. I didn't come to you beforehand and say, hey, say this. But isn't Jesus telling us that he and God the Father are like a mirror? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. See, very often, and, and this is why I said it went a different direction, very often when we ask, in, in particular non-believers or, or young believers, when we ask them to describe God, they'll use words like angry, uh, omnipotent, uh, we did use the word powerful, things that describe somebody that's very um, authoritative, very uh, controlling, manipulative, things of that nature. But then when we ask people to describe Jesus, we very often get compassionate, loving, understanding, caring. We get very soft terms. Why is that? If Jesus says that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about there being one true God. However... We are going to look at him in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So here's what I want you to do. I want, to consider, I want you to consider a triangle. I've got a picture of a, of a triangle for you just to look at. We all have seen triangles. We've all been in school. We know our basic geometry. But a triangle has three sides, yet is it still not one shape? But there are three individual points on the triangle. And while the illustration falls short of describing God, it serves as a starting point for our discussion today. That's why very often we will use a triangle in marriage counseling, in premarital counseling in particular, and we'll put the husband on one side, we'll put the wife on the other in the bottom two corner points, and we tell people that as they move closer to, each, to God, they'll move closer to each other. Just as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as each one of them acts in their own way, in their own power, in their own roles, even though they are still just the one God, 
Each one of them draws closer to the other, no matter what point we start at as we were to connect them. We live in a world of diverse beliefs. It doesn't take very long for you to look through the news, through different religions, through different belief systems to understand that there is all kinds of structures of belief, of, 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 of gods and what they do, things of that nature. And I want to kind of go through we, just some basic, again, religious studies, if you will. Uh, we have, what is the first one we have that is a, sing, a belief in a single God? Do we know the term for that? It's monotheistic. Okay, Mono meaning one, theo meaning theology, God, uh, things of that nature. So, we have monotheistic beliefs. That is, again, the belief in a single deity. We have polytheistics, uh, polytheistic religions and belief structures. That would be poly meaning multiple, okay? So, they believe in multiple gods. Give me an example of a polytheistic religion. Those online were waiting for an answer. Anybody? Anybody have a night in the back? Yeah, just shout it out. Buddhism, absolutely. Hinduism, uh, they've got lots of, they've got Vishnu, the one with all the, the arms, and they got the elephant god, and they've got the, I forget them all. But anyway, what's that? Yeah, same, yeah. And so they've got, they've got multiple polytheistic, they've got all kinds of religions. And then there is the most, well, I'm, my opinion, step out of the pulpit, the saddest of all of them. Ah. What does ah mean when you add ah at the beginning of a word? What does that generally mean? The absence of uh, atheistic or atheistic, atheistic ah meaning the removal of. Amoral means I have no morals. Atheistic means I have no God. I believe in no God. And so we have atheists who, who believe in the absence of God, in the absence of any uh, supreme being, any kind of, of, of overarching deity that would be. And then, of course, there's a branch of these, so I didn't create them as a separate. But what do we have it, it is a branch of atheists. We have agnostics. What does that mean? Anybody know? Good. Okay, I, I, that is exactly right, but I put it a little bit different way. I put it as they're confused. They don't know what they believe. Okay, they, they, they have a system of beliefs that they go, well, there might be a God, there might not be a God, we're not really sure, it's, it's too hard for us to understand, it's too, we just, we're just here. What a horrible way to live your life, to be perpetually confused or insecure, So for us, understanding who God is becomes crucial for our identity as a Christian. For us, we need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what we believe and why we believe about God. So what do we do? What do we believe? What are we as a, an Assemblies of God church, a Pentecostal, Bible-believing, Bible-thumping, tongue-talking, Jesus-walking Christian, what do we believe about God? Anybody want to take a guess? Any of the younger people want to take a guess as to whether we are monotheistic, polytheistic, or atheistic? Shout out. Anybody. We are the one. My sermon title is the answer. We are monotheistic. We believe in one true God who exists in three distinct persons, each with its own function and purpose. If you want to put it in terms that we just reviewed, again, we would be monotheistic. So why does it matter? Because grasping, and this is a big word, so just kind of follow with me. Grasping the triune, the three-person nature of God can deepen our relationship with Him and empower our witness to others. Understanding who each of the persons of God is affects how we act as a body of believers, both individually as and corporately. And so this is what I want us to do today, is that there is the one true God that exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And our understanding of this trinity impacts both our faith 
and our daily lives. So if you're a note taker, that is the synopsis. That is in, in sermon prep, we call it a thesis statement. Okay, that is our, our, our purpose for today. So here's some things that I want us to look at. If you're a note taker, this is finally point number one. The unity of God. I want us to look at the unity of God. God is one in substance. Again, if you have your Bibles, if you want to flip, you can. We're going to go through a bunch of scripture today. So if you're not a quick flipper, you can look at the screen ahead of you. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And this is a, a very famous passage. And it says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Or the Lord is one in another translation. This verse is what is called the Shema Israel. It is a Jewish prayer, or you may have probably just heard it called the Shema. And it serves as the centerpiece of the morning and evening Jewish prayer service. It's the first it, its first verse encapsulates the monotheistic essence of Judaism. And if you are a student of religion, what are we? We are a branch of Judaism. Okay, So while we are very different, we are uniquely different than Juda Judaism, than Jewish faith and religious faith, we are do have our roots in Judaism. And so this... This first part of this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And it gives us this picture of a monotheistic, a, a one belief, a belief in a single God. Matter of fact, if we want to go back to our I am statements, we know that the I am is Yahweh. And the, the verse actually says, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. This is the Shema. So what this teaches us is that God is in essence and being distinct from any kind of polytheistic worldview. See, there's, a, there's one other problem people can have with the Trinity. That the word never appears in the Bible. Now that doesn't sound good, and it's given rise to a legend of the Trinity as an invention of some cloister-bound theologians with too much time on their hands. The story goes that the Bible knows only a simple, boiled-down monotheism, but that with some ingenuity, wild speculation, and a whole lot of philosophical rigmarole, the church managed to cook up this naughty and perplexing dish, the Trinity. And that just is, isn't how the history goes, though. The Apostle Paul, for example, didn't show us any sign of struggle to confess when in Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, you don't see a cloudy ignorance of the Father, Son, and Spirit in AD 50, which is all cleared up by AD 500. And while later church theologians would use philosophical terms and words not seen in the Bible, such as the term Trinity, they were not trying to add to God's revelation of himself as if scripture were insufficient. They were trying to express the truth of, God, of who God is as revealed in scripture. Particularly, they were trying to articulate Scripture's message in the face of those who were distorting it in one way or another. And for each new distortion, a new language of response was needed. So, let's take a pause for a moment and go back to our, our statement of being a good student of God's Word. Okay, It is beyond, it is beyond each of us, beholden to each of us, to be a good student of God's word. This is not up to me. I have said numerous times, don't take what I say as scripture. Take it as guidance, advice, understanding, interpretation, and go home and read scripture for yourself and see if what I taught aligns with what the, what the spirit is teaching you. That is the way that you test a preacher. That is the way that you test the preacher in, in what he's teaching. You don't take what he says at face value. I am just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. 
And sometimes the bread is gone and sometimes the bread might be off a little bit. I don't ever intend to, to mislead, but we're all human. And if you disagree with me, come and talk to me privately. We'll talk through it. Maybe I misunderstood it. Maybe you're misunderstanding it. And we will learn together. That is all, my door is always open for that. So not only, again, is God the Father, not only is He, are, are all three of them in unity, in one in their substance, but yet they are also distinct in their persons. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. The baptism of Jesus where all three persons were manifested in a single place. This is, a, this is the most quintessential, most common passage of Scripture that is used to, to give this example. It says, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, who? Jesus. There's one. Then the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God, there's two, descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Well, if he is the son, who's speaking? The father. And so we have in one passage, in one moment, we have the three distinct persons of God being manifest before the people's very own eyes. Each person of the Trinity has a role, yet each of, yet each of them are individual but one. So, we've established the singularity, the monotheistic. Okay, are you with me? Okay, we, we, we've established that there is a single God who operates in three different persons. Now I want us to dive into the roles. So if you're a note taker, this is point number two, the roles of the Trinity. Well, of course, first off, we start with Father as Creator. The Father as the Creator. We see this in Genesis 1.1. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Our Father is the originator of all things. This is the role of the Father. Can we say amen to that? Okay, we, we would say, so it be. We are in agreement that we understand God as the Father. Yet, what about Jesus? What about His role as Creator? We see in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, the Word already existed. In this context, who is the Word? Jesus. So in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Again, I want to take a pause. I want to give you something again about being a good student of God's Word. Read that passage again. Read the last line. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Is there, is there any other word between the word was and God at the end? The Word was God. There's nothing else in there, correct? Okay. However, there is a Bible out there floating around from one of our, oh, we would call, they would call themselves our sister uh, religions, who inserts the word, the letter, a. And it says the word was with God and the word was a God. This is important to know what you believe, why you believe it, and how to read scripture. If you are not attempting, now listen, I don't have the great, greatest rememberer. Some of you have wonderful rememberers, okay? So I don't, I don't memorize as well as others. But there are passages I do know and I have worked very hard to make sure I know. It is, would impair, it behoove you to know your scriptures. Because something as simple as the word was a God changes the entirety of this one true God statement. And now it is no longer monotheistic. The letter A changes it to polytheistic. 
And these are the dangers of, of falling into those traps. And so we see again, we have God the Father as creator. We see that Jesus was there with the Father. He was God. So he is also, Jesus was present at the beginning. And it is through him all things were created. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. Christ is the, the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms on, on earth. He made the things that we can see, the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. So we have G God the Father as creator. We have Jesus the Son as the creator and then we have the Holy Spirit. Back in our Genesis passage, if you look just one more verse down in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, we see that even the Holy Spirit has been present since the beginning. It says in Genesis 1 verse 2, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. And what? The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So we're putting pieces together. We're, we're putting building blocks together for our belief system and the way that we understand who God is. Then we move to the Son. What is His primary role? The Redeemer. John chapter 3 and verse 16. I'm, I know you can all quote it. We've done it many times. But it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He is the Redeemer. He is the, the, the Lamb, the perfect Lamb that was given as a sacrifice. Jesus redeems us from all sin, from all death. He is our Redeemer. But does that mean the Father and the Holy Spirit are not also our Redeemer? I would turn your attention to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. So the Father plays a role in our redemption process. Does it exclude the Holy Spirit as being a redeemer? Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 and 2. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from, all, from the power of sin that leads to death. Are we putting the pieces together? Or are, we, are we understanding as we lay our foundation that God is the creator along with Jesus, along with the Holy Spirit? Why? Because they are our triangle. They are all one. They are still a single unified God who acts in three different ways within his personality. Even though he is the creator, he acts in three ways of it. Even though he is the redeemer and he allows his personality, his personhood of Jesus to act as the redeemer and he sent himself in human form, that does not mean his spirit was not also present or that he as the father were not also present in the redemptive process. And then we look at the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's role as the empowerer. You know, <laughs> we Pentecostals like this one. And we gravitate to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 real often. We like that passage. And here's why. It says, but you will receive. No, come on now. Come on, we're Pentecostal. Come on. We will receive. Power, there you go, see, we got it. Now, for those that are new to the church and you're going, what's he doing? Okay, when I was a kid and my pastor would say the word power, the church, you know how we say things here, we're like, we're like we'll say amen and people say hallelujah or we'll say hallelujah and people say amen or whatever, whatever responsive back. When I was a kid, if my pastor said the word power, it didn't matter what context it was, the congregation shouted back, well, there's about four of you that did it. Thank you. Okay? But we would shout back power. Why? Because we believe in the power, the life-changing, spirit-filled power of the Holy Spirit. 
And we put our feet on this verse. So, But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I stutter again because I learned that passage in memory in the King James. And so I, I stutter when I change over to the other lang- translation. But the Holy Spirit equips us for God's work and a personal transformation. That's why as Pentecostals, I'm going to use this word a lot, and I hope you know that you're in a Pentecostal church. As Pentecostals, we believe in a transforming power. Not just in our day-to-day lives. Not just because I used to not be saved and now I am saved. That's a transformation that is worthy of shouting about. Amen? But we believe as Pentecostals that there is such an internal transformation that happens that not only do I change inside, but the words that come out of my mouth are changed. And no longer do I speak on my own accord, but that I have the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of me. And that power comes out in a way of prophecy, in a way of a word, in a way of speaking to God and my spirit communing with His Spirit. We call that speaking in tongues. And people go, that's weird, Pastor. No, it's not. If it were weird, I wouldn't do it. Because again, I've told you my testimony before. The day that I received the Holy Spirit, I was at a camp, I was a teenager, and I was in a bad mood. I was mad. I wanted to go home. One of my friends came and said, I was sitting all the way in the back. And it was at, at camp. It's an amphitheater, so it goes up the side of the hill. So the people in the back were almost up at the, like where the balcony is. And one of my buddies saw me, and he knew that I was upset. And he goes, hey, do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? Okay, whatever. And he walks me down all the way down the the middle steps. He goes, lift your hands up. I I promise you, I'm not exaggerating. I was in a bad mood. And I just, I put my hands up. I I wasn't praising, I just put my hands up. And he goes, now begin to pray. And I was like, all right, fine. You know what, fine. And I began to pray. And I was looking just like I'm looking at you today. And the next thing I knew, I opened my eyes. I was staring at the sky. And I was praying to God, but I wasn't, English was not what I was speaking. So I can tell you with all surety, nobody coaxed me, nobody manipulated me, nobody twisted my arm and said, say these, repeat these words. But I found myself in the presence of the Almighty God. And through him, I began to pray and to speak to him in a way that I had never been able to speak before wasn't weird, it wasn't staged, it was genuine. This is the kind of transformation that the Holy Spirit empowers us to have. So does that mean that the Father was not part of that transformation? Because ultimately the Father is the source of the power that flows through the Holy Spirit, through His Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16, I pray that from His glorious unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. That who will empower you? He, the Father, will empower you. And then, of course, we have Jesus. Jesus is the one that gives us His last words. Anybody, what's the last word Jesus gives us before he he leaves and and, and ascends on the mount? Single word. The very beginning of it, it's two two letters. Anybody know? Last instruction. My mom, when she would leave the house, she'd go to leave and she'd say, she'd go to pull the door. Oh, hey, before I get home, make sure the dishes are done. How important is that, mom? How important is that, dad? Hey, your homework better be done before I get back. Yeah? What, was, what, was, what did Jesus tell us? Okay, but what was the word right before that? To go. Jesus gives us the word to go. He's empowering us. We're talking about the Holy Spirit being the empower. The Father is the empower. Jesus is the empower. He says go, empowering us to do, to make disciples. 
Look at, we find this Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Jesus came and told the disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this gives us an amazing opportunity. Maybe you've heard this before and this is old hat. Maybe some of this is new to you and you're kind of putting the pieces together as to how we have what we call the doctrine of the Trinity. Or again, in the assemblies of God, we call it the one true God. But how does this apply to us? If you're a note taker, this is number three. It's implications for Christian living. Well, the first thing it does, of course, is gives us a relationship with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, chapter 3, 13, verse 14, says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Here Paul is giving us all three connection in the way that we live our life, in the way that we are, are, are handling our, our day-to-day walk with God. Our walk with God is enriched by understanding His, and again, I'm going to use this big word, triune, three-part, tri, three, unity, part, nature of God. Just as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have unity, We as believers, too, must have unity. However, we must distinguish between unity and uniformity. Okay, this is important. Catch this, if you will. We need to distinguish between unity and uniformity. The former is voluntary. The latter is compelled. Unity is voluntary. Uniformity is is compelled. In the United States, we are unified under a set of doctrines, if you will, we call the Declaration of Independence, which uh, in the First Amendment gives us the freedom of religion. And you can be Muslim or Mormon or Christian or atheist or Buddhist or whatever else you want to be, but we are in unity that we are, we are to have the freedom to choose our religion. In North Korea, they are compelled to uniformity. They are to believe what the supreme leader tells them to believe. They are to say what the supreme leader tells them to say. The former is an inner condition. The latter is an outward form. Unity is an inward condition. Uniformity is an outward form. Unity must be the condition created in us by the Holy Spirit as we follow Him in a communion, or in a common goal and purpose. Unity must be the condition created in us by the Holy Spirit as we follow Him in a common goal and purpose. To make effective God's redeeming work in Christ to the ends of the earth and until he comes again. Unity is what we seek. Uniformity is not. We will all come to Jesus. We are all working out our faith in our own way with fear and trembling. And every one of us is at a different phase, a different stage in our Christian development. But here's ultimately what it all comes down to. Even though we're at a different phase in our Christian development, it is all for our Christian mission. It is all for what God has set us apart to do. Matthew 28, 19 again, what does he say? Therefore, and go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is our mission. This is our message, is to include the fullness of who God is. We believe there is one true God. We believe that he exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is our job to go and to teach others that same thing. 
It is not our job to quabble about red carpet, blue carpet, red paint, green paint. It is not our job to, do, to quabble over hymns or choruses or anything else that the church in, in the, the last 2,000 years has argued over. Our job is to go. As a believer, our job is to go. The doctrine of the Trinity is to the Christian experience of God what grammar is to poetry. It establishes a structure, a framework, which allows us to make sense of something which far surpasses it. It is the skeleton supporting the flesh of Christian experience. The Christian experience of God was already there long before the doctrine of the Trinity was formulated. Okay, we, again, we understand this because we have it in Scripture. Before somebody had the idea to say, hey, I'm going to create this theological belief structure, we already had the Spirit of God descending like a dove and Jesus being baptized and the Father speaking. But the doctrine cast light on what on the experience and helps us understand who it is that we are experiencing it interprets our experience of god as ex, as experience of god we have the opportunity to know who god is because we have doctrine so there is a, a a thing out there a belief structure or anti belief structure called deconstruction and people are like, I'm going to deconstruct my faith. I'm breaking it down and I'm only going to believe what I want. You know what we used to call this? A la carte. I'm going to take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and I'm going to leave the rest alone. The problem is, is that when we do that, we're tossing away the, some of the best parts of what we understand about God. Deep subject. Honestly, I could probably preach the next three weeks just on this one topic. But I, I, I want it to suffice as we close. I want it to suffice enough that we understand that we are AG. We believe the scriptures are the inspired, infallible word of God. So when we talk in here about the word of God, you know what we believe. You know why we believe it. That we are the, an Assemblies of God church. We believe that in a monotheistic, a single unified God who exists in three persons. And we understand how those things relate to who we are and what we are as we move and live in the body of Christ. So how can we live this out? How can we take a complex, difficult topic and how can we live out the truths that are wrapped up in there? There are some things for us that understanding who God is that when difficulties come, the Holy Spirit is the empowerer, but he is also the redeemer and he is also the creator. That when the difficulties come, when trials and tribulations come, that when we talk and we pray, we don't only speak to God the Father, but we are asking the Holy Spirit for his divine intervention. That we are talking to the Son who gave us redemption. And that the price has already been paid. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of this dark age. It is an opportunity to know again who we are and it to serve as a, a building block or a foundational stone, if you will, to who we are as a church. And when we understand who we are, then of course we understand better who God is.
So how will this understanding shape your relationship with God and your ministry to others? Let's pray. I want us to take a few minutes and to ponder that question. How does understanding who God is shape your relationship with God and your ministry to others? So Father, we thank you and we praise you for your Holy Spirit. And we ask you, God, that your Holy Spirit would reveal to us the ever-present nature of who you, the Father, are and the sacrifice that your Son has made. Father, we ask that your Spirit would dwell and move among your people. That as Father, you would remind us that we live and move and we're created in you. I pray that you would touch each one who is here today and those who are watching online. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as always, the first thing we want to do is if you have not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, if you have not decided to make him Lord of your life, that today would be the day that you would make that decision. If you're watching online for the very first time, we would love to give you some next steps as to what it is. We would love to pray with you. For those that are just here, present, if you haven't experienced the fullness of God in your life, you're saved, but you have not allowed all three persons of, of the Spirit, of, of the Father, of God, into your life. Today is the day to seek Him wholeheartedly. In all versions, in all purposes. And so as the, our worship team plays, we want to invite you, if you need to come and spend time at the altar, the altar is open for general prayer. If you need a touch in your body, in your spirit, and you would like somebody to pray for you, some of our prayer folks will be down here. I'd, I'll be down here to pray with you. Father, we pray over each one today. May you call those who need to be called. May you give wisdom and courage to those who need to come. Hallelujah. The altars are open if you would like to come. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Berea Temple International Church Podcast. We hope that you've been blessed and inspired by today's message. To stay connected with our church community, download our BTIC app from your phone's app store or follow and subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen. We would love to hear your thoughts or questions on today's topic, so please feel free to share them with us in the comments or by sending us a message through the app. If you found today's episode helpful, please consider sharing it with a friend, a team member, or in social media, your support helps us reach even more with these inspiring messages. As we close out today's episode, let us remember to keep working in the Lord's finding until Christ comes. Maranatha. And as always, don't forget to tune in next time for another inspiring message. See you soon.